Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hi Peter, how are you? My name's Rose and I'm looking after your two babies today. How are you? Oh, hi Rose, I'm, I'm very well, thanks. Yeah. Um, so this is, must come as a bit of a shock to you, This um, the birth of your babies four weeks early today? Yes, we, we weren't prepared for it, um, I suppose. Um, yeah, we... Um, sorry. That's okay. Um, it's, I know it's quite, it's quite overwhelming, isn't it, when you've come in today and this has all probably been a, a huge shock and a big surprise. Why don't you come and sit down next to um, your babies and I'll explain to you what we've done. Okay. Because um, your wife will be down in recovery probably for another hour or so. So let's look at your little girl first. Have you got a name for her yet? Yeah, this uh, is Olive. Oh, that's lovely. Is that a family name? Or? Uh, it is, actually. It's uh, my, um, um, my wife's grandmother's name. Lovely. Yeah. So as you know, Olive is um, a little bit, well, you can see by looking at her, smaller than her brother. And uh, I guess the doctors would have spoken to you prior to the birth about why the babies needed to be delivered um, this four weeks early. Um, and so the concerns I guess we have for Olive are related to the fact that she is small and so she doesn't have a lot of reserve and that places her at um, risk of some potential problems, which is the reason she's up here in the nursery. Okay. Um, the most obvious of those is that she doesn't have a lot of fat to keep herself warm and therefore that's why we have her in an incubator. Um, and that basically creates a nice warm environment to keep her temperature stable because unlike her brother or even a term baby, she doesn't have a lot of uh, what we call brown fat, which she can use to keep herself warm. Okay. And yep. um, how long do you think she'll be in the incubator? We Usually most babies will come out when they're around 1,800 grams to 2 kilos, but that will really depend on her. So what we'll be aiming to do is to, um, once she's stable, start her on some feeds. Initially we'll give her some um, fluids intravenously. Um, and so once we can start to get some milk feeds into her and fatten her up, and once she's able to maintain her own temperature, she'll come out. So there's no set weight for that to happen. There's no set time for that to happen. It'll, it'll be a judgment call about how quickly she starts to maintain her own temperature and how quickly we can bring the incubator temperature down. Um, so, Peter, just take me back. I haven't had a chance to look through your wife's obstetric history. These were your first babies, is that right? Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, we found out quite early that we were we were having twins because mm -hmm. we had an, an early dating scan about five weeks, so mm -hmm. we've had plenty of time to sort of think about that yep. and, and prepare. And the pregnancy, um, it, we were told that it was a, a high risk pregnancy because we're having twins, mm -hmm. um, but every, everything seems to have been normal. We've had regular doctors' appointments and scans. Mm -hmm. So your 18 week scan, the babies were both n growing normally, is that right? Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. And in fact, I think it was at that point, um, the scans I think were, were getting um, quite stressful, <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah, so of course. Because we thought things were quite normal, I think we missed a couple of scans 
okay. after that. Okay. And so we, we had the 35-week scan and yeah. we everything seemed normal and my wife felt healthy, but then we had the scan and I think the sonographer was quite um, worried. Right. And so made us or we went and, and saw the Into doctor immediately mode. yeah um yes a little bit and so um the olive's placenta was a little bit um sort of smaller and yeah. and, and used up it had um less less fluid in mm-hmm. it and um i think they were just concerned and so they thought we had to take the babies sure. out immediately yeah yeah so that would have been um, obviously quite alarming for you um, did your wife get antenatal steroids? Um, yes, she did. So we, um, so they arranged for um, us to have a, a cesarean on Friday to get okay. to get Olive out, and the next day, Wednesday, we went back in, and Thursday, and yeah, my wife was given steroids, and I think the. Uh, the baby's hearts were monitored as well Good. for quite a long time. So she had two doses of steroids. That's, That's right. fantastic, yes. yeah. And we can see that those have worked beautifully because Olive is not actually requiring any oxygen at all. Okay. We've just put a little, um, see a little light shining on Olive's foot there. That's called a pulse oximeter. And that's just measuring her oxygen saturation levels for us. And that, and they're reading 99 at the moment. Yeah. She's having no problems with her breathing uh, and neither is her brother. And that would be one of our concerns at 35 weeks, that the lungs um, are still a little bit immature. And so some babies uh, will struggle to breathe by themselves even at 35 weeks. But your babies are doing beautifully. Oh, well, that's and good. that's the steroids that has helped. Yeah. Um, I would say Olive will be unlikely to need oxygen, um, given how lovely she looks okay. now. Well, that's good. But we will do a blood test to check her oxygen levels. We'll just do a little prick of blood from her heel and send that off. Um, we can do that here on the ward, put it straight in the blood gas machine and check that she's doing okay. Okay. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Okay, so when was the last time you saw an optometrist? Uh, I would say about six months ago. Okay, great. So um, did you get a new pair of glasses then? Uh, No, no, I didn't. Okay, and are you wearing anything at the moment? Yes, yes, I've got glasses, which I got about a year ago. Okay, and what do you normally wear those glasses for? Uh, reading. Reading, okay. I generally don't wear them, uh, you know, for distance. Okay, great. So you're, are you happy with how you see in the distance? Uh, yes, I don't have a problem there. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just thinking, uh, you know, that it's getting a bit more difficult for reading, okay. especially small print. The, mm-hmm. the phone book, for example, is... is really difficult for me. Yeah, well, the phone book is difficult anyway, I think. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, that can certainly be quite frustrating. Yes. So do you think the difficulty was there when you got your most recent glasses a year ago or do you think it's gone downhill since then? I think that my uh, vision in my good eye is not as good as it was 12 months ago. Okay, all right, so let's tell me about your um, eye history then. Yes, well, <clears throat> it goes back quite a bit. Uh, 
around about 06, mm-hmm. uh, I started to notice a slight waviness in lines that I was reading. Okay. And so, that was in your right eye? In my right eye. Okay. And the ophthalmologist um, said, you know, you've got a problem with your right eye. You should see uh, a specialist, mm-hmm. a retinal specialist. Mm-hmm. So that was organized by about, uh, I don't know, late 06, maybe into 07. Okay. Um, the specialist did a scan mm-hmm. and decided that, you know, there was uh, an accumulation of fluid in the uh, front of the retina. Okay. Uh, and uh, prescribed a uh, lucentis mm-hmm. uh, injection. Mm-hmm. That was done monthly mm-hmm. for, I think, uh, about two years. Okay. Until I eventually uh, changed over to the eye and ear, mainly because it was costing quite sure. a bit. So how often <clears throat> are you seeing the specialist at the eye and ear now? Uh well, I used to see them initially about three monthly, yes. but now it's about six monthly. Great, okay. So is there someone that you see there specifically, or are you just sort of going through the public clinic? Uh, the public clinic, but in the uh, the retinal clinic that I attend, there are about three doctors, and I see one or other of those three. Okay, so you are getting that continuum of care. Oh, yes, Great. Yes. And... Are they fairly happy with how stable that right eye is at the moment? Well, I think they are disappointed that uh, it was not successful. Mm. I mean, it's... um, I think I've had something like 25 injections of lucentis. yeah. And um, to think that, you know, I've lost central vision in the right eye... Mm. Um, they're not too happy about that. Mm-hmm. But um, the last scan they did, uh, there was no fluid there. Great. So um, uh, I presume it's just a, a wait and watch now and see That's what right. uh, yeah. see what uh, eventuates. So are you aware of what the Amsler chart does? Uh, yes. Um, I've been using it for... Some some years now. Okay, so I'll just run through it just to make sure that you're you're doing it properly because a lot of people do it every day and they don't realise they're not doing it properly and as a result, you know, it there's no point. So um, it basically checks the very very cen- central visual field um, of of both eyes. Um, So it's really important that you cover one eye when you're doing it. The main thing when you're doing that Amsler chart is not to really look for those little nitty-gritty things, but to gauge any significant change. That is the end for Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about different types of breath sounds. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you explain what are the different types of breath sounds? Well, there are several distinct types of abnormal breath sounds. Crackles, also called rails, tend to sound like discontinuous clicking. 
bubbling or rattling when the person inhales, uh, crackling breath sounds may sound dry or wet, and physicians might describe them as either coarse or fine. Stridor is a high-pitched, harsh, wheeze-like sound that occurs while breathing in people with a blocked upper airway. Wheezing noises are high-pitched and persistent that may sound like a breathy whistle. At times, wheezing can be loud enough to hear even without a stethoscope. A short version of a wheeze, called a squawk, occurs during inhalation. Ronky are persistent, lower-pitched, rough sounds similar to snoring. Question 26. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about Heberdeen's nodes. Now read the question. The bony growths that develop on the finger joints are called Heberdeen's nodes, or interphalangeal joints. Mostly, Heberdeen's nodes develop on the joints nearest to the fingertips, causing the fingers to appear crooked. They only develop in osteoarthritis patients. Each joint in our body has a layer of cartilage to protect the bones. Osteoarthritis causes the cartilage layer to degrade, gradually allowing the bones and the joints contact directly with each other. Over time, the bones get damaged from scraping together. Our body reacts to this body damage by developing new bones that are known as nodes. Heberdeen's nodes are one of such bone formations on the fingers of patients with severe osteoarthritis. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc? There are many different surgical treatments for a desiccated disc. In the method called fusion, the vertebrae surrounding the desiccated disc will be joined together to stabilize the back and prevent movement that will worsen pain causing discomfort. In the decompression method, the extra bone or a disc material that has moved out of place is removed to make more room for the spinal nerves. In the correction method, the surgeon will make the necessary repairs to correct an abnormal curvature of the spine to relieve pain and increase range of motion. In the implant method, artificial discs, or spacers, will be placed in between vertebrae to prevent the bones from rubbing. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about outcomes of TB skin test. Now read the question. Doctor, can you explain to me the outcomes of a TB skin test? Well, the outcomes for TB skin tests are not always clear-cut. The main consideration in a TB test is the size of the bump on the arm. If the bump is smaller than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered negative to TB. In a case where the test bump is larger than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered positive. But we have to be very cautious about false positive and false negative. At times, Patients vaccinated against TB using the Bacillus calmet garin can show a false positive result for TB. There is also a possibility that when the patients infected with bacteria similar to TB, false negative result happens when a person has a weak immune system or has been exposed to pathogens such as smallpox or measles. Patients infected with TB very recently and very old TB patients can also show false negative test results. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about atelectasis. 
Now read the question. A partial or complete collapse of one or both the lungs is called atelectasis. That occurs when tiny air sacs in the lungs, called alveoli, deflate. The collapse of the lowest lobes in both the lungs is called bibasilar atelectasis. The lobes of the lungs are filled with millions of tiny sacs, called alveoli, which are arranged in clusters and surrounded by blood vessels. When a person breathes, the alveoli allow their blood to collect oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. During bibasilar atelectasis, the alveoli in the lower lobes of the lungs deflate and stop performing this crucial task therefore blocking oxygen from reaching the vital organs, life-threatening at times. Question 30. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about liver flukes. Now read the question. Doctor, what are liver flukes? Liver flukes is a parasite disease. A patient may never know he has liver flukes. Even the doctors at times may not diagnose the condition because the symptoms of fasciolysis are similar to many other conditions. There are chances that a person with liver flukes living may never develop fasciolysis. Others may develop fasciolysis many years after the liver flukes entered the body. A person cannot transmit liver flukes accidentally to someone else unlike other parasite diseases. Liver flukes make their way from the intestines to the liver once it enters the body. To get into the liver, the liver flukes must burrow through the lining of the liver causing pain in the upper right abdomen. The two types of liver flukes that can affect people are fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic of cystic hygromas. You have 90 seconds to read the questions 31 to 36.
Cystic hygromas are fluid-filled sacs that commonly occur on the neck or head of a baby as a result of blockages in lymphatic system. At times, cystic hygromas are detected through ultrasounds during pregnancy. Some cystic hygromas may not appear until the child grows. Cystic hygromas affect 1 in 800 pregnancies and 1 in 8,000 live births. In 80% of cases, cystic hygromas appear on the face, including the neck, head, cheek, mouth, or tongue. It can usually grow in other parts of the body, including the chest, armpits, buttocks, legs, and groin. Usually, cystic hygromas that are present at birth or develop after birth are benign. However, they can be disfiguring, glow very large, and affect a child's ability to swallow and breathe. At times, cystic hygromas detected during pregnancy go away before birth. A fetal cystic hygroma can be a risk factor for miscarriage. Although usually cystic hygromas affect children, there are rare cases of their appearance in adults. In a remarkable case, a 32-year-old man had a cystic hygroma on his neck that appeared eight months before diagnosis. He was experiencing severe pain and swelling in the right lower part of his face that extended to his neck. Biopsy confirmed it was an adult onset cystic hygroma. Environmental and genetic factors caused the formation of cystic hygromas, mainly viral infections transmitted to a fetus during pregnancy or drug and alcohol consumption during pregnancy are the causes for cystic hygroma formation. However, most of the cystic hygromas are due to genetic conditions, especially due to chromosomal abnormalities accounted for in 50% of the cases. Genetic causes for cystic hygroma are Turner syndrome is a condition where a woman is partially or completely missing an X chromosome, causing change in appearance and problems related to the fertility and heart. Patients with Noonan syndrome may have unusual facial features, bleeding problems, heart issues, short stature, skeletal abnormalities, and many other symptoms. Trisomy 13, 18, or 21, these conditions cause the embryo to develop an additional set of chromosomes that produce a variety of congenital abnormalities, including intellectual disability. Depending on the location of the cysts, the symptoms of a cystic hygroma may vary. Some children may not even experience any symptoms other than its growth. The most common method of diagnosing cystic hygromas is ultrasound imaging. Usually, cystic hygromas are diagnosed when the fetus is still in the womb during a routine abdominal ultrasound. It is also detected in a blood test carried out at 15 to 20 weeks. If the blood test result shows high levels of alpha fetoproteins, it might be an indication of cystic hygroma. Although ultrasound images may indicate the possible location and size of a cystic hygroma, additional diagnosis may be required for obtaining more information such as depth and severity of the growth and any obstructions that can indicate a breathing problem. A transvaginal probe method can take better images of the cystic hygroma without the obstruction of other organs in the way. Fast spin magnetic resonance imaging can provide a clear image and more details about the cystic hygroma. During amniocentesis test, a doctor will collect amniotic fluid through a special needle for testing chromosomal abnormalities. Normally, there is no need for any treatment for a cystic hygroma, as long as it is not causing any health issues. Sclerotherapy is one treatment option in which a specialist injects a chemotherapeutic agent called bleomycin into the cystic hygroma to shrink its growth. However, it may take several therapy sessions for this to happen. Moreover, a cystic hygroma can also grow back. A surgical removal of cystic hygroma may be considered only when the child grows a bit older. However, surgery can cause significant scarring and complications such as damage to nerves, arteries, blood vessels, and structures near the cystic hygroma. In case the cystic hygromas have associations with other genetic conditions that may impact the development of the child, cystic hygromas can grow back even after surgery, treatment, especially if the cyst cannot be removed completely during the pregnancy.
Now look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on delusions of grandeur and its treatments. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 through 42. Well, a delusion of grandeur is an unusual or false belief about one's greatness. For instance, a person with this condition may believe that he is famous, can end world wars, or that they can be immortal. Delusions of grandeur, also known as grandiose delusions, often accompany other mental health symptoms. They may be linked to physical or mental health conditions, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or certain types of dementia. The condition may be persistent, or it may appear only periodically. Certain people with delusions of grandeur also experience other delusions, like an unusual religious belief or a fear of persecution. However, a delusion of grandeur is more than just very high self-esteem or an inflated sense of self-importance. It marks a remarkable detachment from the practical world. A person with this condition may continue to believe in his delusion despite contradictory evidence. Delusions of grandeur come in many forms. Many people experience a similar theme over time. Schizophrenia is a mental health condition that causes delusions, hallucinations, and false beliefs. Bipolar is a mental condition classified by periods of depression, followed by periods of mania. During times of mania, a patient may have a highly inflated sense of self, which can manifest as a delusion of grandeur. During a manic episode, a person with bipolar may tend to spend too much money, have trouble sleeping, appear very hyper, or behave aggressively. Narcissistic Personality Disorder In most mental conditions, patients with a similar condition can have very different personalities. Personality disorders directly affect the personality, fundamentally altering how a person relates to others and themselves. People with narcissistic personality disorder have a very high inflated sense of their own importance. They seek flattery and validation, believe themselves to be extraordinary and unique, and lack empathy. A person with narcissistic personality disorder may have a sense of entitlement that leads them to act in ways in order to obtain admiration and special privileges that is objectionable to others. Most people consider dementia, including Alzheimer, a memory impairment, yet dementia slowly reduces a person's ability to think clearly. It can affect the way we interact with the world, plan, and think. As dementia progresses, some patients develop delusions, including delusions of grandeur. Dementia patients with delusions of grandeur typically have many other symptoms, including significant memory issues. Damage or injury to the brain can also change the way people think at times, potentially causing delusions. Brain injuries may also cause hallucinations, personality changes, memory problems, and difficulties with basic skills, such as reading. Attending group therapy may help the patient to build healthier relationships with others. Treatment for delusions of grandeur is very difficult since the patients may feel these delusions are good to them and truly believe in their delusions, they often resist treatments. Often, antipsychotic drugs are helpful in treating delusions due to many causes. Patients with bipolar may need to take drugs such as lithium or other mood stabilizers. 
Patients with delusions related to personality disorders may require comprehensive ongoing therapy to offset the effects that delusions have had on their personality. Often the treatments for delusions of grandeur will focus on managing and reducing symptoms rather than curing the underlying condition. Depending on the cause, the patient with delusions may need to take medication or have long-term therapy to cope up with their symptoms throughout their lives. Helping a patient to understand how their delusions have a negative impact in their life or relationships, along with support and treatment, the patients with delusions can lead a peaceful life.